Hello, Overcomers, and welcome to this episode of Connect Over Coffee. I am Runsi, the founder of Overcome, and today we are joined by a longtime friend, a great champion of Overcome, Dr. Renee Stubbins. So Dr. Stubbins is a registered, licensed, and certified oncology dietitian and is a member of the Academy of Nutrition and the Oncology Nutrition Practice Group. She practices at Houston Methodist. She is a strong advocate for cancer prevention and personal nutrition therapy before, during, and after cancer treatment. So as we all believe, and we all know that nutrition needs to become cornerstone of cancer treatment as it has some some hidden superpowers that we are just still discovering. So, and she is, Dr. Stubbins is the right person to talk to about this very important topic. So join us for the next 45 minutes to an hour as we chat with Dr. Stubbins. Have your coffee ready. I have mine. And let's chat with her about everything oncology nutrition and if you have any questions as you as we go along please type in the uh, comment sections below and we will get it addressed post the discussion so with that a huge welcome to you dr stubbins to this episode of connective work coffee always such an honor to have you with us thank you very happy to be here so I have like a textbook full of questions for you, but we'll start with something very basic. Um, you know, just wanted to to get your guidance on, we have read and we read about anti-cancer diets, right? So is there such a thing? And if so, please share a few key dietary recommendations on healthy lifestyle and cancer prevention. Yeah, it's a loaded question and a question we get quite a bit as dietitians. Um, you know, I'm kind of, I'm going to refer to like the American Cancer Society and American Institute of Cancer Research quite a bit during our talk, um, just because I think they're both reliable resources. They do a lot of research regarding nutrition and cancer and their big recommendation just to kind of like sum it up as a very plant forward diet. Um, you know, along with weight um, stability and exercise. So, you know, as important as diet is, it's also a lifestyle too. Um, you know, and we have like preliminary studies showing that the wide variety of fruits and vegetables have all these antioxidants and, and phytonutrients and that um, protects our cells from damage. Damaged cells are, you know, mutated cells and the beginning of carcinogenesis, which is the beginning of a formation of cancer. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that you, if you have more fruits and vegetables in your diet, then you have more of these antioxidants to prevent that original mutation it's very hard to prove that though you know um and as far as like what we would call clinical studies which mean it would mean in the human population just because diets are so varied from person to person and there's so many confounding factors to think about so it's hard to like pinpoint on what exactly an anti-cancer diet is I think it's a combination of having both a functional diet and, you know, having those occasional splurges because food's meant to be enjoyed. You know, we want to all, especially now we're getting close to the holiday season, you know, you want to be able to enjoy those occasional splurges. Um, you know, but usually when I get asked this question, I usually encourage people to think the more plants you can have in your diet, the better. Mm -hmm. It's not like you need to become vegetarian or vegan. It's just that we've seen this strong correlation um, and we don't know what exactly it is in that correlation. So a correlation does not mean causation. Um, so it means that we've seen this pattern that people who eat more fruits and vegetables do better. Yeah. Um, and it can be because maybe it's the fiber, maybe they're overall more health conscious, maybe um, it is the phytonutrients in them, maybe um, it's the fact that they are exercising more, you know, maybe it is that they're just, you know, um, more conscious of what they put in their body. So there's a lot of confounding factors that goes into like that quote unquote, anti-cancer diet. Now there's a ton of books out there, you know, that will say this type of diet. And I'm like, well, they're all good. You know, there's nothing 
bad about them, I would say, except no one wants to diet for the rest of their life, you know, because um, the moment you're on a diet, you look forward to getting off the diet so you can eat all the foods you want to. Mm -hmm. So I think the anti-cancer diet is finding a balance between the two. You know, you want to be functional. Yes, you want to eat healthy, but you also want to not restrict yourself so much that all you're thinking about is that donut that you haven't been able to have for six weeks or that you know, piece of chocolate cake that you've been withholding because you're afraid that the sugar in it is going to be bad for you. Um, it's finding that balance in between. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Absolutely. It does. Thank you so very okay. much. Um, so, you know, um, just as a, uh, as a um, addition to this question. So when we talk about improvements in diet for cancer patients, right? So um, going through treatment particularly, um, what are the five key improvements or the top uh, improvements that you would suggest for, um, for our overcomers during the treatment process? And also in the same token, um, what foods should they avoid while going through treatment? So yeah, I'm glad you're clarifying between during treatment and after treatment can be very different. Mm -hmm. um, in my opinion, the most important thing during treatment is to keep your weight the same. You know, I tell my patients, if I know your weight the same, then I know that you're getting enough nourishment to heal and recover whether it's from chemotherapy or radiation or surgery, like that weight stability is the number one important thing. Um, making sure you're getting enough protein. Um, that's also a key element and it's protein from a variety of sources. So both plant proteins and animal proteins. Um, protein shakes are fine in my opinion, uh, but that protein helps you recover. So chemo goes in there, kills the cancer cells, but then your body wants to heal and recover. And if you're not taking enough protein, it starts taking it from your muscles. Once we start losing muscle mass, you're not going to be able to be mobile. You're going to become weaker. You're also not going to be in chemotherapy. Not only targets the bad cells, unfortunately, it gets some of our good cells too. We have like collateral damage. It knocks down our white blood cells, our red blood cells, and our platelets. And unfortunately, there's not one specific food. Trust me, I wish there was a magical food to bring up platelets or to bring up white blood cells, but it's just making sure you're getting enough protein. Because if you don't have the protein, then you can't recover after the chemo. And then you're going to be knocked down, knocked down, knocked down, knocked down. So that's my usually like number one thing I emphasize. Uh, with my ovarian patients specifically, one of the biggest struggles that um, I see is early satiety. So with ovarian, we can get a lot of what we will call it ascites, which is fluid around the abdomen and it pushes up on your stomach. And that can make you feel really full very quickly, which sucks because then you have to eat more, but you can't because you just physically feel feel full. So all of your biology sensors are telling you not to eat. Um, so forcing that can be really challenging. Um, so I usually tell my patients, this is the time where we'll start looking at a high calorie, high protein shake, whether you're making it at home or if it's a commercial one, um, thinking about foods that are easy to digest, that are quick to digest. Ironically, it's kind of the opposite of what I said earlier. So less fruits and vegetables because the fiber in them is going to keep you fuller longer. So you want more, you know, vegetables that are cooked down like into a soup. Um, or fruits that are cooked so the fiber is cooked out of them, more like applesauce or um, baked pears, stuff that's easy, that's going to not sit in your stomach a long time because there's just not enough room in there. Um, the other important thing that I mentioned is hydration. So hydration is very important. I tell my patients, it's like flushing out the leftover chemo. The chemo is going to go in there, do its chemo thing, but then we want to get rid of the leftovers. The leftover, it's like a bad hangover. So the quicker we flush it out, the better you're going to feel. Um, preferably clear fluids. So these are things like your, you know, water, um, your sports drinks, electrolyte, you know, powders into drinks, flavored water, sparkling water, um, whatever works. Um, but you want to make sure you're getting that hydration. That's really, really important. It's okay to have like one or two cups of coffee or a dark tea. It's not going to hurt anything, but you want to make sure you're getting enough fluids. Um, the, I don't know if I'm on three or four right now, but the other important thing is your oral care. 
So a very common chemo that is used, and actually a lot of chemos have the side effect is affecting your taste changes, but carboplatin specifically, anything that's like a platinum-based chemo, so those are your oxaliplatin and your cisplatin, which aren't commonly used in um, ovarian um, cancer, but carboplatin is usually sometimes. Um, but those can give that metallic taste or can make things taste off, or maybe your mouth is dry, or maybe you've had thrush, or maybe you've had mouth sores. So there's a mouth rinse you can make at home that I recommend all my patients. The first day I meet them, I tell them if you have anything that's happening to your oral cavity or in your mouth, I want you to start using this mouth rinse. And it's a about 16 ounce bottle of water. You put one teaspoon baking soda, a half a teaspoon of salt. You take a sip of it, gargle with it for about 20 seconds, and then you're going to spit it out. Do this before and after eating. And what this does is it cleanses your mouth of any bacteria that might be in there that's affecting your taste. Um, it also helps neutralize the acid from our food that could be giving um, you mouth sores. And it's just a good oral rinse. There's no harm in doing it proactively um, or as a preventative. Um, so that's the other thing I mentioned to all my patients. As far as like foods to avoid, these are mostly for food safety. Um, so no raw sushi, no raw oysters, no raw eggs, no ceviche. Um, we do recommend that all like red meat um, be cooked at least medium. Um, I also tell my patients, you know, you can have fresh fruit and vegetables. You just need to wash them and clean them yourself. I recommend cleaning with water and vinegar. So you could either do a soak in a large bowl or in a clean kitchen sink with about a half a cup of white vinegar and let it soak for 10 minutes. Or you can make a spray bottle, which I fill about a third of it up with white vinegar and the rest water. And that can be used as, um, so if you're making a salad at home, um, this is something I would spray on my lettuce and put it in a lettuce spinner and triple wash it. Mm -hmm. um, but I would not buy anything that's pre-cut at the grocery stores. Um, we got a little stricter after the pandemic, just because we just weren't, wasn't sure what COVID did with food. And we kind of kept those same guidelines just as good practice. But um, you know how they have the fresh cut up strawberries and, you know, like H-E-B's homemade guacamole, anything that's a cold prepped item. I usually tell my patients to deter away from them because if someone was sick making it, um, their bacteria could be in there. We just don't know. Now, if you're buying something cold, but you're going to cook it. So like there are simple meals or um, one of the um, easy, convenient meals you can go and take home and put, put in the oven, but it's cold. That's okay. Cause cooking it will help kill any bacteria that's in there. And then if you're going out to eat, you want to do hot food from a kitchen. I don't recommend buffets or salad bars or anything that's been sitting out. So like even nicer places like Subway or Salata, Chipotle, but the food's behind it. So it's not really a buffet, but the food still sits out there all day. We don't know how long it's been sitting there. I don't know how it's been handled. And I just rather my patients be cautious. Um, so those are usually my like quote unquote food restrictions for my patients. And it's mostly has to do with food safety. That's wonderful. Thank you for all that, um, the great advice. So, um, you know, I was just reading about this recently about the the role of gut bac bacteria, right? And then what um, it actually um, has helps patients to have better responses to immunotherapy. Um, so can you tell us, I mean, I thought that was pretty fascinating and so um, that it has a direct correlation with treatment. So can you tell us more about the, the role of this, the microbiome, um, gut microbiome and in maintaining overall health and in general uh, with cancer treatment? So this is such a hot area of research right now and we're learning more and more every day and it's so... Um, Fast. It's it's hard to like figure out what, you know, the gut microbiome, you know, it has over a thousand species of different bacteria that are doing different things. And there's so many relationships to be explored to whether it's the microbiome interacting with the host or is it the food interacting with the microbiome that's interacting with the host. Um, specifically with immunotherapy, 
Um, I think one of the things that I remember reading that has quite a bit of evidence behind it is a higher fiber diet. So uh, there's two types of fiber in the world. So you have your soluble and your insoluble. Your insoluble is like your whole grains, your fruits, your berries. It adds roughage to our stool. Um, your soluble is going to be more like uh, the inside of an apple or a pear, your bananas. It's a little bit more of a softer. And soluble means that it kind of gels your food together. And the reason why I make it this distinction is because the soluble fiber acts as what we call a prebiotic. So if you've ever remember the video game from the 1980s or 90, um, 90s, the Pac-Man. So the gut microbiome or the bacteria are kind of like the Pac-Man and the prebiotics are its food. So when they eat that, the bacteria can use the prebiotic as food. And that creates what are called short chain fatty acids. Um, and these have been shown to have strong anti-inflammatory, you know, properties. And that's kind of where that relationship has shown that correlation. Um, there's probably even more evidence, you know, with other, you know, gut microbiome and immunotherapy. Um, it's just such a huge topic and it's still being actively researched and, uh, there's even some evidence that's suggesting that our gut microbiome has a huge role into playing into our cancer risk, especially colon cancer risk. Um, and, you know, whether, you know, it's too soon to be recommending probiotics um, per se, you know, in fact, a couple of years ago, we took that off like the okay supplements list because we've been actually have seen some studies have suggested that probiotics might actually interact with certain immunotherapies. So it's too soon to say. So I usually will tell my patients, you know, if you want to have a pro some probiotics in your, in your diet, I'd rather you get them from a food source. So like Greek yogurt or, um, uh, sauerkraut, um, those type of things. So something that's been fermented, um, Greek yogurt is probably going to be my number one choice just because it has the protein in it as well. So you get that protein as well. That's wonderful. Thank you. And this is a great segue into my next question, which is, you know, talking about vitamins and supplements, mineral supplements, right? Um, you talked about probiotics and um, tell us, tell us about the role of the vitamins and supplements and, and mineral supplements and their possible interference with cancer treatment and what could be the possible side effects and what are some of the the good ones to have not just even cancer treatment just in general if you want to maintain your own health on a daily basis what would you recommend so my general rule of thumb is i will only recommend a supplement if i think you need a supplement most of the time if you have a pretty well balanced diet you don't need one. Um, I think the most common supplement that most Americans need is a vitamin D supplement, which is actually really, really important that you get checked. Um, you know, it's one of the things like I had mine checked pre pandemic was fine, you know, post pandemic, not so fine. <laughs> Obviously I was spending more time indoors. Um, but vitamin D is very, very important to our overall health. Um, so that's the one I would say that's the most common, um, calcium is also common, especially in my older women. I consider a multivitamin also okay. I will usually, if my patient's already taken it, I just let them continue. Or if I feel like they're not really getting a balanced diet, then I would recommend um, that we consider adding a multivitamin. Um, there are certain indications um, that like dietitians can see and and hypothesize that there is a vitamin deficiency. Sometimes if the, the taste of my patients who have been on treatment for a while, we've lost significant weight. Um, they are technically malnourished and they're really complaining about a lot of lack of taste, then we could have a zinc deficiency. Or, you know, they've lost the taste of meat and they're eating hardly they're getting all of their protein from protein shakes. Okay, we might have a B12 or an iron deficiency. So it's one of the important things that I will usually monitor my patients really carefully. And if I have any suspicions that we will have a vitamin D, I'm sorry, any vitamin or mineral deficiency, then I would usually ask the doctor to order some labs so we can, you know, um, validate that, you know, suspicion. 
Um, we are very conservative. And so I really work hard to establish a relation, a, a trust relationship with my patients because I want them to know uh, that I have their best interest and safety is my number one priority. So I want them to tell me if they're curious about taking supplement, you know, let a, we'll call that best friend bot on the internet that helps boost the immune system and does all these magical, wonderful things. I'm not going to just say flat out, no, you know, I might be thinking that, but I don't want them to know. I don't want them to see that. Like I'm not even considering it. So I will usually look at it and now we have resources to check each, you know, ingredient to see if there are potential interactions. So I feel like it is important to be honest with your care team and know that, you know, we have your best interests at heart. Um, you know, that we want to just make sure it's safe. And sometimes they are, you know, and some physicians are a little bit more open to, you know, um, those alternatives than others. Um, there are the, there are supplements though, that we do know that could potentially interact. So, um, one very common one that I usually tell my patients to stop is vitamin C. So any high dose of vitamin C, you know, a lot of us start taking vitamin C during the pandemic. I'm just as guilty. I was hoping that it would help protect me from COVID. The placebo effect is a real thing, um, you know, but unfortunately it's not backed by science. You know, um, it's a water soluble vitamin. So once we reach a hundred percent daily value, we're urinating out the rest. Our body will not absorb any more than a hundred percent of the daily value. Um, it just makes us feel better that we're controlling something in an uncontrollable situation. But vitamin C and vitamin A and vitamin E are all what we call antioxidants. So which are normally good, right? You know, I talked about those in the beginning. However, this is a different type. This is different because it's not coming from your food. Your body's getting it in a pill form that it's not used to it. And it could potentially interact with the chemo because some ways that the chemo works is by oxidizing the cancer cells, especially if you're doing a chemo radiation combination. A lot of radiation doctors will actually suggest you stop a multivitamin that has too much vitamin C or vitamin A in it uh, because it relies on that oxidation process to kill the cancer cells. And we don't want the vitamin C to protect the wrong cell. It's not that smart, unfortunately. However, it is okay to have things that are high in vitamin C to a certain degree. You know, I don't want you drinking eight glasses of orange juice a day, but having an orange and some strawberries, it's going to be fine because your body is getting it in a food form, in a form that it recognizes. It's not hitting your body all at one time like it would if it was going through, you know, a powder or a pill form. Wow, this is so fascinating. Thank you. And just going back to the the vitamin D for a second, um, we understand how essential this is one of the integral, I think, uh, vitamins that we need to take, when, not just for cancer, but just in general, as, as I mentioned. But um, there's there seems to be a debate on what is the actual level, optimal level for vitamin D. Right. So I have yeah. heard so many people say so many different things about what is normal. I mean, so when we are talking about cancer patients going through treatment or uh, again, just in general, what is the level of vitamin D that we actually are wanting to achieve? I mean, is it 60, 70, 80? What, what is it? The, 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 at yeah. All so, yeah. Um, I would have to honestly go and research to tell you for sure, but my gut instinct is saying above 50, you know, that's personally where I want mine above, you know, which it was a few years ago. Mine's still normal now, but it's a low normal and I want it to be on the higher normal. Um, so I would say good rule of thumb is above 50. That's good to know because, you know, there are, there could be providers who just go by that range that even if you are 20, you are still normal, even though yeah. you're the lowest spectrum of normal. So, I mean, does that need any action or do you just stay with that 20? I mean, it's good to know that he actually optimally wants It's highly, it's highly debated. You know, I, I was in graduate school. I remember I wrote a review paper over vitamin D and colon cancer. And even then it was highly debatable. And I remember, you know, being very frustrated because I would find one paper that would say this and then another paper would say this. But it really came down to, you know, I think it's really provider, you know, preference, but it's good for 
I always tell my patients this could be educated and make your own educated decisions. You know, like I said, I know mine's technically within a normal range or what's considered acceptable, but I prefer it be above 50. And especially if it doesn't have any, you know, adverse side effects, then you should be no. wanting to be in that optimal higher range. So thank you so much for mentioning that. So now, um, you know, you mentioned fiber, uh, soluble and insoluble fiber just going a little deeper into the fiber thing because again that there's so much so much that I'm reading about fiber these days which is fantastic because the more we research the more we get to know about the superpowers of these foods so in terms of fiber um, how can we include more of it in our diet and what kind of fiber should we should we be including more than the others and does it make cancer treatment more effective I think it's good to have it. So during cancer treatment, I think it, it depends on what's going on. So if you're having diarrhea, for example, as a side effect of your, you know, treatment, then, um, you know, fiber, the insoluble fibers not could be your friend. So those are your whole grains, um, your berries, your roughage, you know, Versus soluble fiber is going to be very similar to what we call the brat diet, bananas, rice, applesauce, toast. So like um, I mentioned earlier, it, it absorbs water. So it kind of gels your food together and it will slow the transit system down, so to speak. It's also easier to digest when your gut's already a little inflamed from, you know, the chemo and the radiation. Um, if you're feeling okay during treatment, you know, and you're not having any of these side effects, then I would push for you to have a good combination of both. Um, you know, one of the best things, um, like for example, apples, the skin of the apples, the insoluble part and the fruit of it, or the meat of it is a soluble. So you, when you eat both, you get benefits of both, you know, um, also another example would be like, uh, a green banana, you know, so you might notice that as bananas ripen, they get sweeter. That's why, you know, with my rotten bananas that usually hang out on the countertop, I use it to make banana bread um, or zucchini bread. But um, if you eat more of a green banana, it has what we call resistant starch. And that's more of an insoluble fiber, but it still has the soluble. So most fruits and vegetables are going to have a little bit of both. Um, you know, another example would be if you're cooking kale. You know, when you start cooking it, um, it will turn like a bright green color. And that's when you know it's usually done. But if you continue to cook it or if you put it in a soup, it's going to become a more dull green color. And that's when it's, it's, it's so fiber, it can change. So it's good to get a little bit of both. You know, it's good to have raw kale in a salad. It's good to have kale in a soup because they're going to give you different benefits and it's good to have that variety. It's not like one's going to be better than the other. Um, I had another thought. What was another part of that question? Oh, I was just going to ask, I was just uh, curious whether fiber makes cancer treatment effective or is there any... That's hard to say. Um, I wouldn't say it makes it more effective. We don't know that yet. Um, we don't know that yet. It's hard to say. I think it's highly debatable. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier with the fiber and the immunotherapy, there's something there. Um, but it's really too soon to say to like actually cause a practice change. You know, if I have a very um, motivated patient who's interested in all the research you know, that might be something we'll have a conversation about, um, you know, but it just um, is too soon to say. And um, since we are talking about food and nutrition, just one thing just popped in my head that, you know, someone who is going through cancer treatment, but let's say that person also has diabetes, right? So possibly type one, type two, it doesn't matter. They, they have diabetes, which is restrictive when it comes to foods and the choice of foods and um etc so in those situations with all these you know other you know uh existing um uh, diseases how how is the balance achieved in terms of proper nutrition for the patients um, with these kinds of conditions the balancing act mm -hmm. um you know um 
it can be very challenging uh, for my diabetics on treatment. Anytime our body is stressed or inflamed, then our blood glucose levels are going to be a little bit higher. Um, you know, if I have a diabetic that's becoming malnourished and their blood sugars are 200, but nothing is tasting good, nothing is sounding good, I just want them to eat. By any means necessary, we need to maintain that weight. The diabetes almost takes kind of a backseat to keeping that nourishment on board. We don't want to go crazy here. But, um, you know, again, my number one priority is weight stability, nutrition stability, so I can get them through this treatment as fast as possible without any delays. Um, but it's a balancing because we also don't want the diabetes to become out of control. Very often we will be consulting an endocrinologist during treatment just in case we need to adjust any medication um, that, you know, needs to be uh, for better glucose control. Um, so it, it's a balancing act. You know, a lot of the times I talk to my diabetics about food pairing. So if you're going to have a starch, you need to have a protein with it. So instead of just having a piece of fruit as a snack, you need to put some peanut butter on the fruit or you need to have some cheese. The protein and the fat um, in the cheese or the peanut butter helps like buffer the absorption of the sugar. Um, we really don't need to be drinking fruit juice as adults. It's great as kids. It's good if you're having a low sugar, um, you know, episode, but, um, the fruit juice is going to spike your blood sugar too fast. Mm -hmm. Um, so I rather, you know, them get the actual fruit. Um, but again, it comes down to food pairing. Um, I emphasize that quite a bit with my diabetic patients that you want to have that protein and fat all the time with the meals so that it balances the carbohydrates. You still need carbohydrates. You just don't want to have an excess amount and not necessarily it by itself because it will spike the blood sugar too fast. Yeah, thank you. And because I was just thinking that as we are talking about food and nutrition, this is diabetes is food central, right? So it, it's just the whole life is ruled by food and, and the control of the food rather. So I just had that thought in my head. Thank you for the clarification. So of course. Um, speaking of um, inflammation, right, you spoke about this a bit um, as well. So that is a concern for patients undergoing treatment. So uh, can you tell us about foods that may fight, help fight um, inflammation and what guidance would you have for our overcomers on that? Yeah, so um, hopefully I don't sound too much like a broken record, but, you know, the fruits and the vegetables are going to be your strong, like, anti-inflammatory ingredients for multiple reasons, whether it's the phytonutrients in them or the vitamins, the an antioxidants, could be a wide range of them. Um, in addition to that, if I was going to you name any diet, it'd probably be like a Mediterranean style diet, um, mostly because it emphasizes a lot of plant-based proteins and plant fats. These are just naturally less inflammatory um, compared to animal fats and animal protein. Not like that's bad, you know, but they just have a little bit more unique properties. So, you know, for example, um, avocados, you know, and nuts and seeds, um, the like sockeye wild salmon, you know, has these great omega-3 profile. Omega-3s are probably um, one of the strongest dietary anti-inflammatory nutrients we have out there. Um, and again, you know, I encourage my patients to try to get it from the food source, rather than, you know, take an omega-3 supplement. An omega-3 supplement is actually quite beneficial, especially if you have high triglycerides. And I do have a couple of patients on chemo that are taking an omega-3. Um, there actually is some preliminary studies that suggest it could help with the appetite too. Um, but again, not enough to necessarily cause a practice change, but it's not one of the ones that's necessarily going to interfere with chemo or radiation. However, some surgeons do recommend that you stop it because it is, can act as a blood thinner. And if you're about to have surgery, we don't want thin blood. Um, but that is one of the ones I do have a couple of patients on, on chemotherapy and that I consider safe. Um, but again, talk to the doctors first before you start taking it. Um, 
but yeah, I would say more of a Mediterranean style diet if you're going to be wanting to look. And I, as much as I don't like the word diet, sometimes I feel like it helps for me to say that to patients because it gives them a little bit more guidance than just saying, oh, just eat more fruits and vegetables, you know, where there actually are some great Mediterranean cookbooks, um, you know, and they can Google Mediterranean recipes and explore those things. Um, and also, you know, I think it's good because it gets them to explore adding lentils and legumes to their diet, which is something, you know, I just didn't grow up eating, you know, now I do, you know, because I've had friends introduce that those type of foods to me. Um, but hummus is one of my favorite, you know, go to recommendations for my patients. It's cold. A lot of my patients like colder foods, fresh as hot foods. It's a great source of protein. Um, it can have either a very bland flavor or you can, you know, apparently now there's even chocolate hummus available. Um, but uh I think it's it's helpful to think about it in that sense is kind of a more Mediterranean style um, diet would be more if you're interested in kind of going that anti-inflammatory route. Wonderful. And as you were talking about triglycerides, I was just thinking about cholesterol for a second, right? I mean, that's another issue that sometimes can be another additional thing that we have to manage while going through cancer treatment. So I have read and tell me uh, whether there is any substantiation to this is I've, I was reading that low HDL, low levels of HDL could have a negative impact on or it could, you know, not just on the uh, cancer treatment, but it could also increase your chances or risk of cancer. What is the, um, is there, is that true? And if so, how do we improve or increase our HDLs if, if it's below what it's supposed to be? Yeah. I don't, I, I can't really speak about HDL and cancer. I haven't seen that research, but, um, if I was to hypothesize, you know, one of the big recommendations for cancer prevention is exercise, regular exercise, you know, at least 30 to 45 minutes a day of moderate to light activity, you know, for my older patients and, you know, up to 75 minutes of vigorous activity for my younger patients. And it's good for both types of exercise for aerobic and strength building. Um, but exercise does increase your HDL. So it may not be like the HDL per se, but it might be that the fact that people who have higher HDA levels exercise more and it might be like the exercise component that's, you know, making the cancer risk lower. That's my best guess, mm -hmm. um, you know, but because HDL is also just a reflection of, you know, whether you have a healthy diet or not too. Um, and even if you do have a healthy diet, it also has a genetic component too. I have to work very hard to keep my HDL up, uh, where my husband does nothing and his HDL is fine. Um, but it's, you know, one of the reasons why, you know, I have such an active lifestyle and that's why I get my labs checked because I know I have that heart disease history in my family. So it's good to know those type of things. And again, just to have those regular screenings. So, you know, you know, how you need to modify your lifestyle, you know, to, you know, hopefully not just prevent cancer, but multiple diseases, okay. you know, and I do a lot of talks and I go through like the American Cancer Society record recommendations and American Institute of Cancer recommendations that tell my patients, you know, this isn't just an anti-cancer diet. This is also an anti-heart disease diet. This is also an anti-diabetes diet. It's just a good general healthy diet that's going to be good for your overall health. Um, so it's multi-purpose in that way. Wonderful. Thank you for filtering that for us. And so um, we also talked about, you know, lots of plant powered diets, and there are so many books out there right these days that, you know, uh, talk about this plant powered um, diet. And you also said that, you know, it doesn't have to be fully plant powered, it can just be a balance between the two, as long as you have more plants than anything else on your plate, right? So um, in relation to cancer treatment, though, um, could plant power diet be deficient in some ways? In you talked about protein, you talked about you know the other things that vitamin D and other things you want to see um, at the optimal level for your patients. So when it comes to plant power diets, is it could it be deficient in some ways for when you're going through cancer treatment? Oh, maybe. Um... 
you know, it just depends on what's happening during that, that journey. You know, I try to encourage my patients, like, let's just take one day at a time, one cycle at a time. You know, um, I have my patients that are highly, which is great. They're highly motivated, you know, unfortunately being diagnosed with cancer, you know, it's not good, but it helped give them almost a wake up call. Like they, now they want to change their lifestyle. They want to eat healthy and they come in and they're super motivated. And I love that. That's awesome. You know, it makes me so happy. But at the same time, I know the chemo regimen they're getting is going to be challenging, you know, and I don't want them to feel like they're failing, quote unquote, if they're not able to do this perfect, healthy diet. I want them to understand that right now, like, okay, it's great. If you want to eat, if you're feeling good and you want to eat healthy, great. But it's also okay if you don't, you know, if the only, if the only thing that sounds good to you is, you know, a baked potato or, you know, French fries, just eat it. Like if that's, what's going to work for you in that moment, that's more important than quote unquote, being healthy. We can worry about being healthy and starting this amazing diet once you start feeling better. But I want them to understand that that's not necessarily, um, it's ideal, but you know, it may not be realistic, unfortunately during treatment. Um, some people it is, you know, some people, they have a very smooth journey and, you know, they'll incorporate fruits and vegetables in other ways. A lot of my patients, you know, maybe they are having a little bit of challenges. So we start making fruit and vegetable smoothies, you know, we'll use Greek yogurt as a base. We'll add a protein powder. We'll add the fruits and the vegetables to the smoothie. Great. That's three to four servings of fruits and vegetables a day. So it's a good compromise, you you know, they're getting the protein that I want and they're happy because they're getting these plant foods in there, which also makes me very happy. Um, so it's balancing and it really is very personalized depending on that person's journey. Um, you know, but there are ways to do it, you know, making a vegetable soup. Um, you know, some of my patients, um, unfortunately, <laughs> they'll start doing these great juices, you know, which are really high in fiber and they're like a cold pressed juice, but it's too much fiber. So, you know, now things are going the other way, you know, we're having uncontrollable diarrhea, which isn't good either. So then when I go and talk to them, I was like, okay, I want you to eat nothing but white starchy foods. And they're like, but earlier you said, and I was like, yes, I know, but now I have to do this. So it changes. It just depends on what they're going through at the time. Um, I know that's not very helpful, um, but there are ways, you know, to add the fruits and the vegetables. It just depends on what's going on, but working with a dietitian, you know, she can certainly, or he can certainly help you, um, you know, develop those, you know, interventions to meet both of y'all's goals. Absolutely. And it, to your point too, and every day is a different day. Every day, the, the side effects may be different and you may be going through something different. And so, especially when you are in the active treatment phase, when you move on to the survivorship phase though, yeah. and then it's different Then having a much more, you know, controlled um, diet could be actually very beneficial for you. But to your point, if I could summarize is when you're going to the treatment, if whatever you can have, that should be your first pick um, and not worry about making it optimal or, you know, like it has to be the perfectly healthy option doesn't have to be as long as yes you exactly yeah. yeah and definitely during survivorship you know um I had a patient actually uh just finished treatment and I said and she's like okay can I call you once thing once I you know after I you know recover after this treatment I'm like absolutely and we could talk about the most beautiful diet you ever want you know like now that we're through like you know we'll definitely fo refocus our goals and you know have that conversation and at that point you know I do encourage my patients to make little substitutions. So for example, like instead of chicken Parmesan, let's maybe try eggplant Parmesan or instead of a traditional lasagna, let's try a vegetable lasagna um, instead of beef stew. And I, how about we make a lentil soup, you know, or try, I try to encourage them, especially if they don't already have fruits and vegetables in their diet and they're just not sure, you know, maybe they grew up, you know, like me, I grew up in a very much meat and potatoes household. We didn't, ha we had some vegetables, but not, not 
really. Um, you know, not as much as I eat now. And it took me a long time to like vegetables, you know, it wasn't until I figured out roasting vegetables was the way that I preferred, you know, um, but it, I encourage them to try like a meatless Monday, you know, try to eat vegetarian just for a day, try to make these little switches, um, to add more fruits and vegetables, you know, to your diet. Okay. Instead of snacking on chips, how about we grab some bell peppers and hummus? Um, so little changes like that are also good to consider once you're moving into that survivorship role and you want to add more fruits and vegetables to your diet, um, just to kind of create a more healthy balance. Makes sense. And, and you already um, kind of focused on the chemo friendly foods and how we should manage and handle uh, while we are going through the treatment. So just moving on to special locations, right? It could be holidays, it could be weddings, it could be events, you know, where you want to splurge a little and not just, you know, uh, with food, but perhaps with alcohol. So uh, what is your recommendation on both food and alcohol uh, when it comes to special occasions and where you're celebrating something and you want to be feeling good about that. Yeah, I think it all comes down to moderation. So as far as food goes, you know, I encourage people to practice what we would call mindful eating, you know, which means don't eat for the sake of eating. You know, if you're going to enjoy that piece of pumpkin pie, I um I encourage you just to take a bite, close your eyes and really taste it. Like what makes it so delicious to you? What makes what makes you so happy about it? You know, sit down and take the time to enjoy it. Um, mindless eating, you know, the best example I can think of is if you're going, you remember when we used to go to the movies and people would eat the popcorn and they're just sitting there and they're just eating it and eating it and eating it. They're not even thinking. They're just eating and eating and eating. And before the movie starts, you're already halfway through. And, you know, I, we're, I'm just as guilty. You know, it's a human reaction. And but those mindful don't help. Those no. don't help. So, yeah. No. Um, but mindful eating, especially when it comes to the desserts, I tell my patients, be picky. I'm a dessert stop. I grew up with my mom making homemade cookies, my grandmother making homemade pies. So I have high expectations. If I want a chocolate chip cookie, Chips Ahoy is not going to settle it for me. I want homemade chocolate chip cookie with like real butter. I want, I want it to taste like I expect it to taste because nothing else is going to satisfy that craving for me. And that's can be challenging to, for, you know, um, for individuals to, you know, think about. Um, and it takes practice to like stop and think about what you're eating and what, you know, what's tasting good to you. Um, you know, I encourage patients when you're at a holiday party or um, at an event, um, don't don't stand near the food table or the dessert table. Get up and walk around, mingle. If you're sitting down, practice putting your fork down and holding your water or your drink and taking a few sips. Practice talking to people while they're eating. Try to slow down and think about it. Um, splitting desserts is another good option. Um, but it, it, it really comes down to moderation, you know, um, another exercise I used to do with my patients when we would have in-person classes is I would bring Hershey kisses and I would give everyone a Hershey kiss. And I would tell them the story about when I was in graduate school, I used to do counseling at a gym and I had a patient, she would eat a whole bag of Hershey kisses during Oprah. And she said she couldn't help herself. She just, and I was like, okay. And so I brought a whole back to her and I was like, all right, I want to watch you eat it. And she's like, what? And I said, yeah, I'm going to watch you eat the whole bag of her. She kisses. And I was like, oh, but here's the thing. You can't chew it and you can't swallow it whole. You have to let it melt in your mouth completely. She got through chew and said she was full. That's so amazing. that that's, you know, the example of mindful eating is when you slow down and you think about it, you're going to get a lot more satisfaction um, out of those few bites than if you were to eat, you know, half a cake, you know, hopefully you're not eating half a cake, but you understand what I'm saying. Yes. Um, so it's finding that, you know, control and it's hard. You know, I have some patients and you got to be honest with yourself. I have some patients that are like, you know, out of sight, out of mind. They can't have the temptation. 
They just can't, you know, they don't have, and that's okay. That's important because you need to be honest with yourself on what is going to help you with your personal goals during the holidays. Um, You know, I have some patients, they're like, I will only eat sweets on Saturday. You know, I'm like, okay, that's, that's, that's the, you know, the structure you need. That's the structure you need. So it's okay to be honest with yourself about that. Um, you know, and find other alternatives instead. Um, as far as alcohol intake, unfortunately, alcohol is strongly linked to a lot of cancers. And both American Cancer Societies and American Institute of Cancer Research do recommend us to limit our alcohol. Um, so zero to one drinks for women, which is a little frustrating because what does zero to one mean? <laughs> and then one to two drinks for men. Um, so I usually tell my patients, you know, um, save it for special occasions, you know, um, I, and you, you, you can't, you can't bank them. So what I mean by that, you can't not drink five days in a row and then have five drinks on Saturday. It doesn't work like that. <laughs> it's moderation every day. Um, but you do want to try to limit it. So one of the things I, um, uh, actually, to see is becoming more popular as mocktails. So a lot of restaurants now will carry a mocktail menu. I have a very close friend. They're going through treatment right now. So whenever we go out to eat, um, you know, it, the bartenders are actually a little excited because they get to get creative and make a mocktail. Um, and cause at the end of the day, we just want a pretty drink. We just want to have a drink that's pretty and, you know, makes us happy. Makes- and I think we might have lost connection there. Okay, there you are. No, I can I can hear you. Uh, okay. So yeah, I mean, thank you for thank you for that uh, clarification. It's very important, and as on the alcohol as well as the food. So, um, if I were to ask you just uh, uh, you know a uh, fun question is what's what is your most favorite food and or dish and why? What would you share with us? As long as y'all don't judge me, I'll share. <laughs> um, so my favorite dish is my mother's fried chicken um, with white rice and white gravy. And I have the chicken and the rice. There's no vegetables. And I pour the white gravy all over it. It's my comfort food. It's my birthday dish every year, every time I see my mom. She doesn't even have to ask me what, to, what I'm, she's going to make me. It's going to be fried chicken and gravy. That is so special. Thank you for sharing with us and we are not judging. So, <laughs> And so uh, this has been a fantastic conversation, Dr. Stubbins. And like I said, I could go on with, with this, I mean, especially I am personally very invested in this and I understand and I read a lot about diet and nutrition. And um, so I had many more questions that I didn't even get to, but we could potentially do another part with you coming up in the future. But just in closing, We know with all these new and exciting advances that are happening, um, understanding the link between healthy lifestyle and cancer prevention, or even like reaction to cancer treatment and all survivorship and the entire spectrum of it. So with that in mind, uh, what message of overcoming would you share? Would you like to share with our audience in terms of not just preventing, but also um, in overcoming ovarian cancer? I would share, take a day at a time, give yourself some grace, you know, it's a journey, it's a marathon, Um, you know, be ready to pivot, you know, and change your goals, be flexible, Um, you know, and know you have a great support unit, especially at Overcome, you know, you've built such a great support unit for them, Runzi. So, um, I would just say take it a day at a time as far as like diet and nutrition goes. I would also say just take it a day at a time, you know, and let, you know, again, I would just emphasize whether you're in treatment, then I would say weight stability is the most important. If you're in survivorship or interested in prevention, I would encourage you to just try to add more plant-based foods to your diet and incorporate exercise as well. 
That's a fantastic message to um, to wrap this up. Thank you, Dr. Stubbins. This was a very, very fascinating conversation and I definitely learned a lot from you and look forward to the future advances that are uh, about to happen in the next, you know, I don't know, three, four or five years um, in the whole nutrition spectrum because I do believe that food has superpowers that we are still just kind of discovering as we go. So thank you for this uh, fabulous discussion and overcomers hope this was beneficial for you. I know I, I did learn a lot from Dr. Stubbins, as I always do. Every time I speak, <laughs> I, I learn something new. So um, as I always mention, please share this video far and wide with anyone who may benefit from all these great insights and pearls of wisdom that Dr. Stubbins shared with us today. And we will be back with the next episode of Connect Over Coffee very soon. Until then, you keep overcoming. Thank you and bye.